Well, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining me tonight for this talk. Um, you will you will find that this uh, we we will be talking about mainly one photographer, but then we will be talking of another person who was very connected uh, to Robert Capa. It's a story which, in fact, has already been made as films. Uh, you know, and various various movies have been done on their on their life. Kappa and Gerda were basically press photographers or war correspondents. And uh, their life really reads stranger than fiction. I mean, uh, if you don't really know that it's happened, you'd say it's been exaggerated because their life was full of, uh, um, full of, I mean, uh, events and incidents, uh, etc. It's it's uh, it's a very interesting story. Apart from that, naturally, you will be seeing a lot of Robert Kappa's uh, work. So, without more ado, we'll start. In fact, here I have started with a quote from Robert Kappa, where he states, in war, you must hate somebody or love somebody. You must have a position or you cannot stand what goes on. When he's talking in uh, this way, he's talking in the, in the guise Guys. of of a uh -huh. war, war, war correspondent. Please switch off your mics. Please switch off your mics. Um, they, they must be. Uh, he, he is actually talking from the base of a press photographer, a war correspondent. Uh, in fact, there is a lot of uh, talk about the what this the saying goes, because what he's basically saying, a lot of a lot of things we read about press photography, sometimes they tell you you must stand away from what is happening in front of your camera so that you don't have a bias. But I tend to agree with Kappa when he says that to really come out with a good, good photographs, you can't not have a bias because you are there, you are a person experiencing what is happening in front of you. And if you don't have a bias, that means you are very, you know, detached from what is happening. So I don't think that that works well for for photography. In fact, it's also uh, it, it's it's always been a dilemma of the photojournalist. Um, Kappa was very passionate about his work. In fact, he he would risk his life at any time. The fact that he eventually died during whilst doing his work is also proof of this. Was he? Uh, a sane man, yes, he was, but he was so passionate about his photography and about getting the message out through his photographs that he would really, you know, forget and risk risk his life a lot of times. Um, you will see eventually how, how it, 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 it went, his life. In fact, Kappa is an icon in photography, particularly in press photography. He was actually Hungarian and he was born as Andre Friedman. In fact, his name was later invented. We will discuss that. His, his actual name was Andre Friedman. Friedman. He was born with an extra finger, which was removed in surgery. And the family he came from was a liberal Jewish middle class. So he had the uh, Jewish blood in him as well. His mother owned a fashion shop and his father was a tailor working from his wife's shop. Unfortunately, father was a gambler, so um, Robert Kappa or Andre's life were, were not easy, particularly, particularly when he was still young, because the father was very much in problems gambling away whatever was being earned. At school, Kappa, this is an early photograph of him, <laughs> he was a, a, a good student, but always independent, always a rebel. I, I feel that his character really suited press photography and war corresponding because you have to be really adventurous, independent, and maybe yes, slightly mad. Uh, when when young, he he would he and his friends would roam the streets, you know, doing practical jokes and and other things. What were the basic, the main influences on, on the young Robert Kappa? I'm, I'm going to start calling him Robert Kappa because everybody knows him like that. Uh, the first we find is uh, Eva Besnio, who was, a, a, again, a Hungarian girl he met at school. 
Um, and he was more or less infatuated by her. And he used to follow follow her around, trying to take snapshots with of of her. They became friends as well. And I think she was the one who sort of spared him on to become to start photography. He would at that time he would not know where where it would lead him, but um, it was that little spark which made him more interested. Apart from Eva, <laughs> who, who he definitely was interested in, also. Uh, in photography. In fact, Eva says about him, these are two quotes by Eva, which actually show a little his character. Uh, he was a good fellow. If, you, if he liked you, he would do things for you. He was warm, but he also had a nice touch of irony. Very smart and eager to learn, sharp-minded, but not too hard-edged, a little cynical. Uh, the next one, the next quote is, is also, um, Typical of him, he was very amusing. He, he was fun. He, 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 was, he had a character and could tell things in an interesting way, funny and exaggerated. Life was too dull for him. He made it seem more interesting. In fact, that's why he ended up going into the work that he did. Um, another main influence was Hungarian journalist, journalist Lajos Kassak who uh, was actually an anti-fascist and, and anti-authoritarian, believing strongly on the rights of the individual in society. In fact, uh, at first, Kappa, through being influenced by this journalist, his first wish was to become actually a writer, a journalist. But then things took uh, a different uh, turn. At that time, when, when Kappa was 18, in fact, he was actually arrested in, in Hungary. It was under dictatorship and he was arrested by the secret police for participating in a demonstration against the regime. So here we already see that at a young age, uh, Kappa was uh, very individualistic, ready to stand up for the rights of everybody. So he was already getting a bit into trouble with authoritarian uh, governments. He was released through the intervention of his father from actually prison by the secret police, but he was banished from Hungary. And here we see that Kappa starts moving around uh, other, other countries. In fact, this is a copy of Kappa's 1931 Austrian passport, and it also proves that he was, uh, his name was Andre Friedman. Like everybody else, the, the passport fo photograph doesn't do him much, just, much justice. <laughs> uh, in July 1931, so he left Hungary for Berlin. And as we will see soon, it was from the frying pan into the fire. 1931, we are approaching the uh, dictatorship of Hitler soon. His first job in Berlin was as a darkroom assistant with a magazine. So here, his photographic uh, education started developing also at another tangent in the darkroom, because as you know, at that time, it was all um, monochrome, black and white photography. Uh, and in fact, his first assignment was to cover a political Berlin rally with the magazine that employed him. In fact, press photographers in that Berlin rally were banned, but he concealed a, a camera and shot, you know, uh, hidden. The images were published by the magazine that he was working for and his career sort of took off. But his first major real break in photography, like a lot of um, famous photographers, one needs that little break to put you up another notch. It came uh, when he was sent by the same magazine he was working for uh, to Copenhagen to photograph Leon Trotsky. Trotsky, as most of you know, was a leading figure uh, in the resurging communist uh, um, and political situation in, in Russia at that time. In fact, his photos captured Trotsky's style. As you can see, this is what the, not a lot of these pictures um, remain, but this is a, a rare one of them taken in November 1932 while Trotsky was lecturing. As you can see, it's a snapshot. No, I mean, uh, 
all beginners with a, with a, with a camera would be able to do it. But um, it seems that sort of the passion that Trotsky would have while orating, while, while passing on the message, uh, his political messages, uh, it would Kappa manage to sort of bring it out in his photographs. In fact, he continued to work and, and study in Berlin until Hitler made him an exile once again. Remember, he had been exiled from Hungary and now um, when Hitler started coming to power and persecuting uh, emigrants and Jews, uh, Kappa fitted in both, both, both areas. He was wise enough to realize and he left to work as a freelance photographer in Paris in 1933. Here fate also plays a hand in fact and uh, in 1934, just a year after he was in Paris, he met another German Jew who was Gerda Pohorils. She called herself Gerda Taro. In fact, you can understand because her saying name is hardly pronounceable. And the love story between, a strange love story actually, between Kappa and Gerda started here in Paris. In fact, here is a picture of them while they were in, in, in Paris in 1937. Gerda was another very independent person, particularly when one considers that she was a woman in, the, in those times. Uh, and she was uh, very radical on, po on politics. She had been um, uh, arrested as well. Uh, and she was into, uh, into photography as well and journalism. She was born to parents in Stuttgart. She was actually German born. And she was, uh, as, as a young person, she was in the communist, communist organization. Uh, and was already distributing anti-Nazi leaflets and putting up communist propaganda posters. As you know, the communists were uh, suppressed by, by Hitler and like most Jews, uh, they had to, most of them had to leave the country to avoid being uh, put in concentration camps. In fact, she was also arrested by the Nazis on 19th March 1933 and interrogated about a sup supposed communist plot to over overthrow Hitler. I wish she had been successful, actually. In fact, she was rather um, fortunate to be released by, by the Nazis in 1933. If, if it was, had been another further years closer to 1938 or 1940, I'm sure she would never have been released. Uh, when she got out of prison, she used a fake passport to travel to Paris again, where she was looked after by some communist networks. Here we see a picture of uh, Gerda at her typewriter, uh, very young, very young uh, woman, I mean, uh, but very, um, very strong character. In Paris, Kappa starts teaching Gerda photography and finds her a job in the newly formed Alliance Photo Agency. Uh, in fact, she wrote the text for, for the, the stories he photographed and also started acting as his photographic agent because Kappa was doing also freelance work, not only working with magazines, but um, started doing his, his, own, his own work and trying to sell his own pictures. Taro, in fact, found she could charge much more for images taken by a rich American, a rich American in inverted commas, because Kappa was anything but a rich American, and she named him, she penned his, the, the Robert Kappa name for him, so he, because it would be a much more commercially viable for people, particularly in Europe and America, to buy photographs from a rich sort of, a rich American, not a poor Hungarian named Friedman. In fact, this is how Robert Kappa, the name, was actually born in a way. It was invented. And Kappa started as, it, as he grew more popular, remained uh, and used that, that name uh, throughout his, the rest of his career. There were various reasons for this move because uh, of their pre precarious economic situation. They needed money and 
it was much more feasible to do this, to, to, to work under that name. Uh, the anti-Semitism that was happening in Germany, so they didn't want to show that uh, Kappa was actually a Jew. Uh, and also in France, there was growing, um, again, um, we, we, we've seen this in our, in our country, and to these days, the problem of people not accepting foreigners too much. Uh, because they were actually, both Gerda and Kappa were actually refugees, even when they were in Paris. In fact, um, this worked, and Kappa's images started selling for quite a good sum, much more than what, what was normally uh, being, being paid for, for press photographs or things like that. Um, the deception was soon revealed by the editor of View magazine, who was buying images from Kappa. However, he, they, the magazine were doing quite a, quite a lot of success with his photographs, so they kept it sort of hidden, kept using the Robert Kappa name, and when the Spanish Civil War exploded, um, View magazine did not hesitate in sending Kappa to cover the Spanish Civil War. As you know, the Spanish Civil War was just before the Second World War exploded. It was actually a sort of proxy war between uh, um, nationalists and communists and their proxies, because the, the actual Nazis supported Franco, the nationalists and, uh, and uh, the communists, Russia supported the others. So it was, and it was also quite a very, very cruel uh, war, where in fact, we saw the employment the, 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 of, of the uh, tactics, the, the air, air, air raid tactics of, of the Germans. They were in fact using the Spanish civil war as a practice ground for what was going to happen in a much worse way in the Second World War. In fact, when Kappa went to the Spanish Civil War, Taro went with him, Gerda Taro went with him. And now remember that she was already, she had already taken up photography and started doing also her own pictures. Here we actually see uh, his accreditation for Life magazine. Uh, in fact, he, you will notice that it certifies Andre Friedman, Kappa and Brackets. <laughs> and this is, um, had been done in Bar Barcelona 1939. As you can see, even from the photographs, Kappa started looking quite, uh, in fact, uh, later on, you will see that he was involved even in, in the movie industry, because even his, his, his actual physical appearance was quite that of a, of, of like a film star of that time. Here we see um, a picture taken by Gerda of Kappa in Spain, 1937, during the Civil War. Uh, you can see even the, the kit he was wearing. Uh, it's rather today we start sort of laughing because it was a, a normal trousers and, and the jersey. The camera was nothing great, so you can imagine. And he was actually, as you'll notice, he has also a movie camera on his back, so he would be shooting sometimes movie as well. Uh, this is another picture. This is Gerda Taro with a Spanish soldier. The, the soldier is not is not Kappa naturally, but you can see uh, certain pictures. This is a picture by Kappa of of Gerda. It was uh, actually an adventure. The Spanish their Spanish work in in the war was actually ended as soon as it nearly began, nearly, because the plane that was hired by the magazine to take them to Barcelona actually crash landed in a field on the outskirts of the city and nearly, uh, they were, they were, it was miraculous that they weren't killed. Here we start seeing some pictures of the Spanish Civil War, Republican soldiers leaving as as you can see, this picture is a sort of happy one. When, when wars start, you always find that everybody is very enthusiastic. Everybody thinks that a war is going to finish in a couple of months, that they're going to be glory. And then when you see other pictures at a later time, you will notice that it's not really like that. All wars are a, are a big problem. 
In Spain, Kappa started getting the reputation for risking his life every, nearly every day. Taro as well was so often seen running across with her camera and I, I don't know if it was bravery or clear nearly madness, but, but the two were hell bent on taking pictures and trying to capture the, the, uh, the war in the best possible way. In fact, to try also uh, to raise awareness on in Europe, particularly of what was happening. Uh, because the the Nazis were helping one side a lot, the other side were quite disadvantaged in the Spanish Civil War. But on the other hand, a lot of people like Kappa and Taro, etc., uh, and certain certain uh, intelligentsia from from Europe went to Spain to fight uh, there. Another another very famous person who had been in Spain and and in fact he had met Kappa was. Uh, uh, Hemingway, the famous writer, who was also in Spain uh, fighting for the cause. <coughs> in fact, here you see another picture taken by Capa. This was in, Sp in Paris while he was in Paris. And here we have another image of Gerda Taro uh, in 1936, taken again by Capa. Here is a few pictures taken by, by Robert Capa of the Spanish Civil War at its beginning, and naturally he shot always in, in monochrome. Here you can see um, the people apprehensive, looking apprehensive because there is an air raid just coming in. Uh, at the beginning in Spain, I mean, people didn't even think it was it, it was going to happen that the, the, the Germans would bombard them with with aeroplanes because it was more or less a, a novelty. And thus many people died in the first waves of, uh, of attacks because there were no shelters, dug nothing. Here again we're showing um, Kappa had a habit also of going very close to his subject. These are some, some images of, of Kappa. Uh, at one time, they both went back to Paris for a short time with Taro returning to Spain and working with Canadian journalist Ted Allen, who became actually her lover instead of Robert Kappa, in fact. <laughs> Kappa had stayed back in Paris. In fact, their, their relationship was rather a strange one, but both of them were very strong-minded, they were both very independent, so naturally their, their relationship could not be something that is so stable. Uh, in fact, uh, um, she remained with Ted Allen until, until actually she died. Uh, in July 1937, disaster struck and at the young age of 26, Gerda was killed when a, when a tank uh, was in an accident. It wasn't even during um, a conflict situation. It was just an accident when, when a tank hit the car she was in and she became, unfortunately, the first female photojournalist to die in battle. As you can imagine, at 26, she, she had hardly started her life. Uh, Ellen, in fact, and also Kappa never never saw her again after that because Kappa never met with her again, naturally because she was still in Paris when she died. And uh, according to the nurse who was on duty when she was was entered uh, into emergency hospital in Spain, uh, Gerda's last words were, did they take care of my camera? Sort of, it, it echoes sometimes something that happens to, to some of us photographers. Um, <laughs> I remember when I was once hit by a car myself in, in, in this trend while, while working with, while doing photography at the marathon, my first fe feeling was to get up and see where my camera was, but at least I could get up. 
Cap, uh, in fact, later dedicated his book, Death in the Making, which is a book on photography, to Gerda Taro, who spent one year at the Spanish front and who stayed on. This is actually his, his quote in the, in, the, in the book. He was very uh, taken by, by Gerda. I mean, uh, although uh, Taro eventually had, had left, left uh, Kappa for another, for another person, I think that, that they had influenced each other a lot. Uh, as in fact, um, in fact, Kappa was himself flamboyant, a heavy drinker, gambler, liked to change women. Uh, and amongst his lovers, <laughs> you include Ingrid Bergman as well, the famous Swedish uh, film star. So um, you can see that how, how their characters, although they matched, but they were too much, I think, of the same ilk to remain really together. Uh, both of them actually were spared on through to do work that they because they they would feel they felt that their photographs, like most photojournalists do, could change the way the world and people actually think. It's something that we see in in top uh, photojournalists. Uh, this passion to try and use photography to influence um, society and raise awareness on various issues. I think it's one of the most noble causes of photography that today is rather being lost. Uh, Kapp, in fact, uh, vowed that he would never marry. This is actually one of his uh, cameras, the contacts. He used various cameras. Um, but after Taro's death, he was quite uh, emotionally taken. Uh, in fact, Eva Besnio, you remember the Hungarian girl who Kappa used to run after when he was young. This is a quote, um, some quotes from her. And uh, about Gerda, she, Eva said that she picked him up, gave him direction. He had never wanted an ordinary life. And so when things didn't go well, he drank and gambled. He was in a bad way when they met and maybe without her it would have been the end for him. So he was not in a great shape when he was in Paris after he had been uh, sent out from Berlin. Uh, on December 3rd, 1938, picture post, Kappa had his, his work has be, had become now very much uh, in request and uh, you know admired throughout throughout uh, everywhere because he was getting the, the, the best magazines of the time, you know, uh, posting his pictures. In fact, Picture Post, the, the famous Picture Post American magazine, uh, quoted him as the greatest war photographer in the world. You might agree, you might not agree. I mean, it's just to see how his, uh, how he was, he impacted everybody. Perhaps this is his most famous and controversial photo, photograph. It's again shot during the Spain, Spain Civil War in 1936, and it is the death of a Loyalist soldier. The Loyalists were soldiers um, that Kappa and Gerda were working for. They supported them. There is a lot of controversy where, whether this image was staged or it was actual fact. Um, having gone into it quite in depth, I have a feeling that this image was staged. Uh, in fact, it's uh, Robert Kappa was one of the top and the first photographers with Magnum Photos, the, the famous agency. After the Spanish Civil War finished, uh, naturally we got the Second World War, war from 1939 to 1945, uh, and from 41 to 45, uh, Kappa was the Euro was a European correspondent for Colliers and then Life magazine. I'm sure you have all heard about Life magazine. And he traveled a lot of uh, in a lot of places, particularly Africa, Sicily and Italy. I am sure many of you have read this quote by Kappa. And I also sometimes quote him myself. And he would say that if your pictures aren't good enough, you aren't close enough. That's why many of you sometimes <laughs> tell me 
listen, you are you are fixed on cropping, on going close, because I believe that you should go on the area which is important in a photograph and cut off any other things. I, I am very much in favor of Kappa's philosophy. Here we see some of Kappa's work in World War II. This, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, in, in Sicily, Italy. And this again is uh, another picture by Kappa. As you know, at that time, most war correspondents will, would, would again shoot in a very candid manner. Although some pictures, maybe like this, would be staged for the purposes of propaganda. These are all coming from Robert Kappa. I think they don't, one doesn't need to say much about these images because as good images do, they speak for themselves, particularly when they are uh, journalistic. If you note also the, the, the years that they were taken, I think that's important because it puts the pictures in a certain context. Uh, in fact, uh, Kappa documented actually five wars, you know, uh, elections and also the official founding of, of Israel, which was actually another, nearly another war. Uh, and he famously accompanied the first wave of soldiers that landed on the beaches in on D-Day. He was the, the only official photographer tasked with accompanying the first wave of those soldiers. Uh, in fact, on his D-Day experience, he said, the bullets tore holes in the water around me and I made for the nearest steel obstacle. We, we, I mean, in brackets, we all know what this must have held through looking at uh, Saving Private, Private Ryan, the, the movie. Uh, you can imagine it was horrendous. He continues, it was still very early and very gray for good pictures, but the gray water and the gray sky made the little man dodging under the surrealistic designs of Hitler's anti-invasion brain trust very attract effective. Unfortunately, very few pictures from Kappa survived. I, again, I'm sure those of you who have heard of Robert Kappa have heard of the story that happened, which we will be talking about. This is one of the pictures from the day that survived. And these are another two. Naturally, he was totally on, on, the, on the landing craft with the soldiers, I mean, running into the bullets like all the rest. And he was only armed with a camera. In fact, he shot several films, but only 11 negatives survived after he his life in that way. Why? Because when he sent the films back to Life magazine, a darkroom assistant <laughs> turned up the heat in the drying cabinet and fried all of the negatives nearly, which was a disaster for both Kappa, for, for, for the magazine and also for history, because so little survives from the pictures of those landings. In fact, this is a still from Saving Private Ryan. It's not a Kappa movie, but it is it is well known that Spielberg actually um, studied the photo a lot the photographs of of the few photographs that Kappa survived um, when he was setting up and making the movie. This is actually Robert Kappa himself who would. Uh, sometimes even, you know, parachute into uh, enemy territory. As, as you can see, he was an adventurer, he, nothing sort of, uh, and quite a daredevil, nothing sort of put him away from trying to get the picture that he would want. Here, while the Allies were going up and recapturing Italy, Kappa followed them as, as war correspondent, and there's a lot of work of his that still survives. And here you can see his, his motto of getting in close to the subject. 
remember at that time not even zooms were were being used you you they were they were using all the time fixed focus lenses Again, these are all pictures coming from Kappa. This is a, an image coming from Paris when when uh, the Parisians stood up against the, the Germans and uh, together with the Allies kicked them out. This is another Kappa image from, from Paris showing yeah, there's naturally not being fit very well. German prisoners of war. The Americans treating everything as a party as usual, whenever they can. <laughs> Uh, this was another story, the American killed by German sniper, it's Kappa's work. Actually, he was more or less considered one of the last soldiers which died in, the, in 1945. Because already the war had supposed to be ended and he was shot by a sniper, by a German sniper. A cover of life by, by uh, Kappa. <laughs> When, when the actual war ended, uh, Kappa became what he always wanted to really be, an unemployed war correspondent. Why did he want to be an unemployed war correspondent? Because he, now he was freer. He could try and shoot anything that he wanted. He, he didn't have to sort of do work for the newspapers and magazines, which he didn't like. It's always, this is always what, uh, what, professional photographers or photographers who have had a long career always work towards, you know, because throughout your career, you're always trying to balance uh, your commercial work, which pays for, for your living and your artistic work or personal work, which is your passion. Um, and this is here after the war, he had become so famous uh, that he didn't really, really need to work for, for uh, anybody but just started doing his own projects and what he actually liked. Uh, one, of, one of his projects was actually a book on Russia uh, with the text by the famous author uh, John Steinbeck. Russia had been more or less very closed after, after the, the Second World War and he managed to start going to places to shoot uh, where very few had taken here you can see some of the pictures of, of Kappa when he, when he did this project in Moscow. As you can see, it's, uh, it was uh, around 1950s, uh, everywhere pictures of Stalin, Lenin, etc., etc. This was a dancing school in Moscow. He did a lot of projects, but then returned to cover the war, um, the Israeli War of Independence in 1948 and 49. Because naturally, remember, he was originally a, Jew, a Hungarian Jew. So I am sure that this the situation that was happening over there and what what the Jews had had suffered before they were they took apart, they started settling in Israel. For him, I am sure it was something that he want, he needed to to work on. Definitely a project that he he was happy to do. And we'll talk a bit about the creation of Magnum. Magnum is a a very well known agency which boasts mostly all the top iconic photographers in the history of photography. Bresson, as I'm saying, was also part of Magnum. Uh, in fact, in 1946, after the war ended, he became a United States citizen. And along with, uh, in, with Cartier-Bresson, as I said, David Seymour and George Roger, who were two other uh, well-known photographers, not as much as Bresson and Kappa, but uh, one, one doesn't, can do good to study also 
photography, they established Manium as a photo agency in order to fight for the rights of the press photographers and also to market their own photography and not have to pay commissions to agencies, etc. Uh, it was not an easy uh, thing to set up because most of the member, the, the, the members that of Magnum were very individualistic, as you can imagine, photographers and artists. So a lot of clashes and disagreements would happen. But it kept going, and Magnum today, as you know, has is is a really big name where agencies go. It's like the National Geography geographic for for photographers for press photographers uh, here you see a stamp an early stamp which which kappa would and magnum would would stick on the back of the pictures uh, so now we come to the another another stage of of robert kappa's life and we come into hollywood um, between assignments, Kapal used to live after the war in Paris. And it was a quite, quite a famous hotel. And his friends included Ernest Hemingway, naturally met through the Spanish Civil War, Steinbeck, who did the, the, the work with Moscow, Erwin Shaw, the, the, the poet, Cartier Bresson, the famous photographer, Picasso as well, and also Ingrid Bergman. In fact, in 1945, Kappa became the partner of Ingrid Bergman, her lover anyway. Uh, in fact, he met her while touring Europe in order to entertain American soldiers. And he had met her there because he was doing some photography at the same events. And eventually he followed her back to Hollywood where he worked for American International Pictures for a short time. Uh, the relationship, as any relationship with Kappa, was doomed to, to, to end, ended in summer 1946, uh, when, when Kappa again got the, the bug to travel and he left for Turkey. Bergman didn't like that and she stopped the, the situation. Uh, in fact, here you see Ingrid Bergman with Alfred Hitchcock, Hitchcock in one of the Hollywood movies of 1946. In fact, this is another quote which shows what Kappa, how Kappa used to think about things. For a war correspondent to miss an invasion, similar, for example, to is like refusing a date with Lana Turner. <laughs> so for him, he could not say no when, when it came to uh, adventure, danger, war, whatever. Uh, he, due to his contact in Hollywood, he started taking film stills as well. Behind the scenes, uh, you know, while films were being done, this is one of his uh, pictures of Ava Gardner. Um, another image, these are by, by Kappa. As you can see, color started appearing and started being used. And here there is a famous picture by, by Kappa of Picasso with his son. And I'm sure most of you have seen this image as, as well with Pablo Picasso and one of his first wives, Paloma Picasso. He even went to China. This is a, one of his passes that he, when he, he, he went to do photography in China. Uh, like the, the Russia project, the Chinese project was as well quite novel because very few, few uh, photographers had had traveled there to, to shoot um, the society and what was happening in China at that These are all pictures of different pictures from his dif different stages of Kappa. Here we see a photograph taken Tour de France, the, the cycle race. And we start arriving a bit to the end. In 54, Again, Kappa got the wanderlust and he volunteered to go to Indochina, uh, which was mainly uh, the, the first 
Vietnam War between the, the French and the communists. This is one of his images as well. And here we see that uh, the images become much more graphic. This is actually Kappa's, unfortunately, last picture. What happened uh, that while in, in Indochina, in fact, it was at the end of the war of Indochina, he was uh, going around with a group of soldiers. Um, you know, just just it was it wasn't any it, any battle scene or something like that. It was a routine reconnaissance. He just went down from the from the truck, running around to take a picture, and he was killed instantly, with the camera still in his hand when he stepped on a mine. All that I've said, all of this life, which I've tried to compress in this little time, it took Kappa just 40 years to do all, all that work. Uh, like Gerda, he also died, unfortunately, young. And this also makes, makes his name, you know, usually when, a, as you know, when an artist or a famous icon, particularly when, when a person dies young, uh, people and, and society seem to go much more towards that, that, that figure. In fact, this is a quote uh, by Cartier Bresson, which I think is very, very explains it all. Power, the dazzling Matador's costume, but he never went in for the kill. A great player. He fought generously for himself and for others in a whirlwind. Destiny was determined that he should be struck down at the height of his glory. It's also very, very ironic that he died not during a combat uh, session, but a recon, re routine reconnaissance session. You know, all, all, the, all the, the dangers he had been in, in the Spanish Revolution, in, in, in Italy, in Germany, on D-Day, he managed to go through all that, then to be struck by destiny, uh, by stepping on a mine in a field, unfortunately. In fact, uh, he was buried um, in America, and here we see his head, headstone, also written in Jewish. Everybody knew him as Robert Kappa, so he never used his name anymore, his original name anymore. Just a little story, which maybe some of you have heard. There is actually a movie about, of, of it. It's quite an old movie, but very, very interesting if you can get it. The Mexican Suitcase. This is a, some, some stills from them. Uh, what happened was that this suitcase discovered in Mexico. That's why it's called the Mexican Suitcase. It was discovered in two, 2007, and it had thousands of rolls of exposed film, black and white film, by Kappa and Taro. In fact, uh, from it, um, it was discovered that a, even some, a lot of images which had been earlier attributed to Robert Kappa had been actually taken by Gerda Taro. So from this, we know that this is also another story which, which is very interesting. I, I do tell you, if you're interested in these stories, to go into the Mexican suitcase and, and see the movie, because it's very interesting and it goes in, in depth on it. Uh, there are also um, YouTube interviews and movies on the work of Robert Kapp on D-Day and the, the, problem, the problem that the films were actually uh, destroyed. So if you want to keep uh, seeing and exploring this, this character, because I don't call him only a photographer, he was a character. Uh, you can, you, there's so much more that you can go into it. These are books on uh, Robert Kappa and about Robert Kappa. In fact, there is a, a movie about him. And uh, I'll end with this quote by, by Kappa himself. I hope to stay unemployed as a war photographer till the end of my life. 
it is not always easy to stand aside and be unable to do anything except record the suffering around one. Robert Kafa. Was he sincere with this quote? I'm not so sure because he he would his adrenaline, I'm sure, would start um, raising high through war photography. He was into it. His his character suited suited that that work. Um, naturally, I'm sure he was in places where the 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 dilemma goes in of whether to put down your camera and help somebody around you, and I'm sure he would have done that as well. Kappa remains an icon, as much of an icon nearly as Cartier Bresson is for street photographers, Kappa remains the icon of press and war, war photographers. I thank you very much.